Tonight, from near Kamloops to Kelowna, wildfires drive thousands of BC residents from their homes. My cousin phoned me and said, man, we're on fire. Just blew over the river and terrible. We'll look at the state of the flames and the forecast. Uncertainty for evacuees in the Northwest Territories, wondering when they can go home. I've heard between three and five weeks. I've heard, you know, we're hoping to get back next week, but who knows. Tropical storm Hillary hits the California coast, then heads inland. More rainfall in the next few days than they've had in the last few years, so that's problematic. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. British Columbia remains under a state of emergency. Travel restrictions are in place and crews are battling out of control wildfires across the province. There is some positive news. Firefighters are making progress, but there has been damage, reducing some homes to warped metal and ashes. Tonight, thousands of residents wait and worry, not knowing if they have anything to return to. Right now, there are 14 of what officials describe as fires of note. Crews are in urgent fights to keep houses safe from the flames. The McDougall Fire is in the Kelowna area, where officials say crews have caught a bit of a break. The fire is said to be less intense today. In the Shuswap region near Kamloops, the Bush Creek Fire is the merger of two large ones. It now covers more than 40,000 hectares. Approximately in order, another 36,000 under alerts need to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. Yvette Brand has the story of those living near that Bush Creek fire. The firestorm hit the Shuswap region northeast of Kamloops with no warning. Everybody were out there and we were all trying to get sprinklers going and all of a sudden that just blew over the river and... Just uh, in such an amazing... Oh, terrible. People fought flames to the last minute. The uh, gas station blew up. Our trailer park burnt down, so we were right there. We were trying to fight the fire ourselves because we had no help, so we had like three pumps set up. He says one man almost didn't escape. And I looked, it was all red. You know, it was all red. I thought, is that fire or is that smoke? Smoke doesn't go red like that. It was a fire, eh? The red flames were showing about, about uh, two blocks over top of the mountain, eh? A steady stream of evacuees headed here to Kamloops Reception Centre. I think we lost everything. My chickens, my cat, all the trailers, lost everything. I wanted to go back, but we couldn't. The concern is about the number of properties that may have burnt down. There, there has been very widespread impact in some of these communities. Probably some of the most extreme fire behaviour BC might uh, ha have ever seen. Fires and roadblocks are driving frustration. In the town of Chase, a driver ignored a roadblock and headed toward the fire. Until I went over the bridge, all the sprinklers are going and the fire is right there. And I'm thinking, oh my God, hurry up traffic, get off the bridge. <laughs> she did get out. I mean, so many people have worked so hard to get where they are, you know, have kids, go to school and all that kind of stuff. And then this happens. And you think of Kelowna, where they're worse off than we are. Her house stands, but many are gone. And Yvette, today Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said the, the federal government will be offering support. That's right, Ian. I think it'll be welcome relief in a lot of the communities that we drove through today. Uh, he has approved BC's uh, request for federal assistance, and he says that the Canadian Armed Forces will be coming in to help with logistics, to help with evacuations and with staging. And there is a lot of work to be done. As, as you know, more fires have broken out. And, you know, it's just a really difficult time for a lot of the people that we're talking to on the road. Yvette Brand in Vernon, BC, north of Kelowna. And let's turn to Kelowna now. The region, a major tourist destination and wine producer, has been hit hard. Mira Baines has that story tonight. Underneath a thick blanket of heavy smoke, firefighters fought back flames, then tangled with raw emotions. I kind of wanted to start off by just thanking, uh, sorry, it's been a long few days. Um. Residents, too, have been hit hard. One evacuee found out through security camera footage sent to her by neighbours that her home was destroyed. It didn't feel real until I saw the extent of damages, right? The, the, 
the flames up and eventually the, the nothingness that was that was left over. But there's hope in the form of calmer winds and cooler temperatures, allowing firefighters to take some control. No homes burned in the last 24 hours, say officials. No loss of life. We are finally feeling like we're moving forward rather than we're moving backwards. He says the situation is dynamic with more hard days ahead. All resources are focused on the firefight and on those evacuated from their homes. For now, its vital tourism industry is on hold. We're just not showing our best right now, but we will again. So um, we just asked you to please give us that consideration and come back at that time. With thousands of people on evacuation order, accommodations are desperately needed. Tourists are urged to cancel vacation stays. However, cancellation fees on third party booking sites are a snag. Our industry, unfortunately, has zero control over third party booking sites. Still, normally busy wineries are quiet. Some business owners are also on evacuation order. When we think about the short term and being able to sell wine and then the long term and being able to make wine to sell for next year um, is kind of a twofold problem at the moment. This popular kangaroo farm shut its doors to keep people away and animals safe. Air quality here is at a high risk rating. Another reason to stay at home. Mira Baines, CBC News, Kelowna. Now to Canada's other major fire story. Crews in the Northwest Territories are fighting hard tonight to protect several communities under threat. Those include Fort Smith, Hay River and Yellowknife. Here's a glimpse of what's underway. A giant fuel break, a gap in the forest dug outside Yellowknife, meant to stop the flames from reaching the city. They are still about 15 kilometers away. A little bit of rain and a lot of hard work have stalled them somewhat, but there was movement today, and fire officials warn activity could pick up in the days ahead. The vast majority of yellow knifers have fled that fire. Cameron McIntosh caught up with some in Edmonton today as they kept their eyes on the north. Literally fighting fire with fire. Helicopters dropping fire from the air to create controlled burns to consume the fuel feeding the wildfire threatening Yellowknife. As water bombing planes also attack the wildfire itself. All while crews continue to cut around 10 kilometers of control lines. But there are no guarantees it'll work. Some troubling trends in the forecast in terms of winds. Fire officials say flames may still push through. The city is not safe. Uh, we strongly encourage folks to um if who have not left to leave most people 19,000 residents already have many driving over 24 hours to places like edmonton registering here as evacuees including michael Uy. so what do you what are your biggest needs right now so the hotel or the accommodation the plan is to put up to 5,000 people in hotels here that will take days to sort out it's a similar story in other communities including calgary also housing about 5,000 people. It is encouraging because this is what we do, right? Like, we're Alberta, I can't say enough good, right? Yellowknife City Councillor Steve Payne is grateful, but also warns this likely won't be a short visit. There's a lot of rumours happen or going around. Um, I've heard between three and five weeks. I've heard, you know, we're hoping to get back next week, but who knows. So, distractions welcome, like a free trip to the zoo. We go see a giraffe. <laughs> Probably no giraffe, but we're going to see the zoo. Zoo. Yes. Exhausted, evacuees are realizing this will take patience. For them, this message from home. You've got a massive group of people up here uh, from across all levels of, your, of our society here working desperately every single day to get you home safe. And Cam, having to watch that firefight play out from afar must only be adding to how difficult this is for residents. Oh, absolutely, and we've been hearing that over the last few days. Take where I'm standing here in Edmonton, this uh, evacuee reception centre. People say on one hand they're very happy and relieved to be here. The fire is now 1,400 kilometres away. But on the other hand, they say they still feel like they're in the middle of it, and in many ways they are. So on one hand, it's reassuring to hear that there are hundreds of personnel, including international firefighters, working to contain it. With each day that passes, that adds to a growing but fragile sense of optimism, but underlying that is a realization of the reality 
that Yellowknife is still largely at the mercy of the wind. Ian? Cameron McIntosh in Edmonton tonight. Most of those who drove out of Yellowknife ended up in Alberta, but others stopped earlier in Fort Providence, Northwest Territories. Juanita Taylor shows us how that community is embracing them. When I got here, this was Angela Canning's only way out of Yellowknife, driving her husband's truck, towing their camper alone for the first time in her life. Just, you know, taking my time. I was, I was completely white knuckle the whole time. Canning's husband is still in Yellowknife. He's an essential worker. She wanted to stay close to him, so she opted to stay in the Northwest Territories, stopping 300 kilometers down the highway in Fort Providence. I was so thankful that when I got here, um, I didn't even know where I was going to go. When Ian Downey fled, he ended up sleeping in his truck. In the rush to get out, he says he forgot his tent. But his needs are still getting met by the community. There's no shortage of food or water or anything here. I mean, you go to the arena and they'll, uh, they'll give you food, coffee, water, anything you want. Within hours, people heard he needed a tent. Now he's got one. And to help out the evacuees, sites at the campground are free, something this mom of two is grateful for. Do you lose your income? You know, one check that I had is like towards this, right? And things ain't cheap. Try and stay positive and, you know, be kind and polite because, you know, a lot of people are in the same boat. Evacuees are also being provided with meals, food and toiletries by the community here in Fort Providence, something they're familiar with having hosted evacuees before from floods and fires. This Satu elder, also an evacuee, sings a prayer song for rain. She's also calling out for people to protect the earth and everything growing on it. It's our responsibility to look after that to make sure that that grows forever for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren's future. But we haven't done that. Juanita Taylor, CPC News, Fort Providence, Northwest Territories. East of there, along the Alberta border, another major firefight. A wildfire south of Fort Smith is only about four kilometers away. Humidity is falling and winds could push the fire directly towards town. Sprinklers, fuel brakes, and helicopters are all being used in this fight. Well, weather is a big factor when it comes to fire conditions, and CBC News climate specialist Darius Madavi is in Vancouver. And Darius, what can BC residents expect in the coming days? Well, it looks like conditions might be improving for those out in the field fighting the fires. But over the next couple of days, a lot of people in BC will still be experiencing quite smoky conditions. So if you take a look at this first map, you can see where a lot of these places are, have these, the, sm the smoke really locked in because the winds won't be blowing too strongly, which is great in terms of fighting those fires. Because uh, really, when we talk about fire weather, we're looking at four different things. The first one is temperature. We want temperatures to stay below 30 degrees Celsius. And they have been uh, for the last day or two but they might be coming up a little bit uh, back up to seasonal in parts of the BC interior. The second thing we really care about is humidity. This could, uh, high humidity can let a lot of that moisture soak into some fuels and keep our fire danger down. But it looks like things will be pretty dry through the interior, which is not abnormal for a lot of these places in BC. Wind conditions will be improving with winds blowing away from a lot of the locations of these fires, uh, blowing them away from the communities that we really care about. And the last thing we really need to worry about is precipitation. And we do have some good news here. Into the beginning of next week, it looks like we're going to have lots of rain moving into the south of the province, especially in some of these places that are going to be really hard hit by these fires. All right, so that's great to see. Let's, let's take a look at the other big area of concern around Yellowknife. Uh, can firefighters expect any help there from the weather? Unfortunately not. Like BC, Yellowknife has seen quite a dry and quite a hot season, uh, but it doesn't look like they're going to be getting the same help over the next few days. If you take a look at this map, you can see uh, Yellowknife here. And if we zoom out, we can look at a lot of the precipitation patterns that will be coming over the next few days. And here we don't see any rain hitting that fire that could be helping firefighters out. Winds will shift quite a lot, but they'll be blowing relatively weakly, so that could be some good news. But it does look like BC is in a better spot in the next few days than Yellowknife. CBC News climate specialist Darius Madavi here in Vancouver. Thanks. Thank you.
A rare tropical storm is pounding the Southern California coast. Thousands of flights have been delayed or canceled. And as officials declared states of emergency, they warn the worst is yet to come. Katie Nicholson is tracking it all for us tonight. Torrents of brown water rip through the streets of a Pacific Mexican town. Floodwaters so strong they swept a man away to his death. That is crazy, guys. Now, Tropical Storm Hillary has hit Southern California. We are expecting a rare and dangerous rainfall event with significant flash flooding, river flooding, mudslides and debris flows. Nearly 24 million people are under some form of flood warning. Hillary could break rainfall records in California, Nevada and Arizona. The amount of rain that is projected to hit that area is more rainfall in the next few days than they've had in the last few years, so um, that's problematic. From the sky, the L.A. County Sheriff's Department warned people in low-lying areas to leave. On the ground, storm surge barriers pushed up against properties, a last-minute sandbagging operation, and rising fears. Flooding where people get uh, lose some property is one thing, but flooding where people die is another, and I'm afraid people might die. Hillary is the first tropical storm to make landfall in California since 1939. That storm killed nearly 100 people. The state may not be used to this type of weather, but the mayor of its largest city says it's ready. Los Angeles has deep experience responding to crisis. Whether it be wildfire or earthquakes, the city is prepared. While Hillary could well spell disaster across three states, by Tuesday, as it tracks north, it could bring much-needed rain to Canada's wildfire fight. It will go up into the northwestern United States, and right now we're looking like uh, southeastern British Columbia, hopefully maybe into the interior a little bit to provide some fire relief for the, the Kelowna area. But for now, Hillary remains a largely destructive force as it churns deep into Southern California and brings a deluge to the desert. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Washington. The Netherlands and Denmark say they'll donate dozens of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine to help its fight against Russia. Together with the Netherlands, we are the first country to make a solid and concrete commitment to donate Western fighter jets. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was in Denmark today to receive the news. Denmark and the Netherlands haven't yet specified exactly how many of the U.S.-made jets will be sent, and they will only be delivered once training of Ukrainian pilots is complete several months from now. Russia's first lunar mission in nearly 50 years has failed. Its robotic spacecraft, called Luna 25, has crashed into the moon. Russia's space agency says it lost contact with the spacecraft on Saturday, two days before its scheduled landing on the moon's south pole. Scientists believe that area may have craters of ice. Luna 25 would have been the first spacecraft to land in the region. India's probe is expected to land there Wednesday. The U.S. and China also racing to reach the same spot. I don't want uh, China to get to the... South Pole first. Next year, NASA will send four astronauts, including Canada's Jeremy Hansen, on its first lunar orbit since Apollo. Its ultimate goal is to establish a base. To the moon, to Mars, and beyond. While flying closer to Earth, many Canadians have had their travel plans derailed by airline delays or cancellations, and disputes for compensation can take months to resolve. Now, as Travis Danraj explains, some disgruntled passengers are choosing a different route. Frustrated passengers aren't hard to find at Canadian airports these days. I just don't have any sympathy for the airlines. Christopher Chen has been waiting hours to board his Toronto-bound flight. There was some kind of mechanical issue, a classic, classic line, which apparently allows them not to pay or do anything. Over at the airport bar, similar sentiments. Three hours ago, they canceled the flight. 20 minutes later, they said the flight's back on. And then I arrived at the airport about an hour and a half before my flight, and it got delayed another two hours. Getting compensation for a delay or lost luggage can also be frustrating. If an airline disputes a claim, the Canadian Transportation Agency is usually the next step. 
Problem is, the CTA has a backlog of over a year to hear cases. Part of the reason some passengers are bypassing the CTA altogether and suing airlines directly. More people will complain, something will come out of it that other people would not have to go through what I have. It. Last year, Sonia Malik says Air Canada lost her baggage on a trip to India to visit her dying brother. Now she's taking Air Canada to small claims court. We're not left with any choice. We try to find out, we try to send them emails, we make phone calls, we don't get anywhere. It's like $8,500 I've lost plus time. In April, Ottawa laid out measures that would increase penalties for airlines, but some experts say there's a problem. The industry has an inside track to the CTA, and the CTA is not staffed with people who are looking to protect the passengers' rights. He thinks the CTA could make a difference. So you give a few $250,000 fines to the airlines, I would expect behavior to change. Just days ago, a new wrinkle emerged. Canada's Supreme Court agreed to hear an appeal from airlines who say parts of Ottawa's Passenger Bill of Rights contravenes international law. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Toronto. Hundreds of people gathered in Niger's capital on Sunday. They were supporting coup leaders who have pledged to restore civilian rule within three years. <laughs> Heads of a regional bloc have vowed to take military action to reverse the coup, but on Saturday, a delegation met with the leaders in hopes of finding a diplomatic solution. With thousands under evacuation order in B.C. and thousands more on alert, people are being warned to stay vigilant. Stay in, to stay off the roads so that the emergency service vehicles were able to do what they needed to do. My interview with Kelowna's mayor and his message for those living near the flames. Plus... A new champion has been crowned at the FIFA Women's World Cup. It's incredible. They pulled off one of the hardest feats in sports. Spain's historic rise to the top and what it means for the game. We turn our attention to the men's 100 meter final. And the Canadian record at the World Athletics Championships. We're back in two. Paramount Prince led from start to finish to win the $1 million prize at Toronto's Woodbine Racetrack. Named in honour of Canada's reigning monarch, this marked the first running of the King's Plate in 70 years. It was the Queen's Plate during the reign of the late Elizabeth II. And elation for Canada's Ethan Katzberg after winning gold in the hammer throw at the World Athletics Championships. It's Canada's first ever medal of any kind in that men's event. The 21-year-old set a new Canadian record of 81.25 metres. There is also celebration in Spain tonight as the country won its first ever Women's World Cup. Chloe Rinaldi shows us the triumph and the adversity the team faced along the way. Spanish supporters erupted with joy at the final whistle as Spain won the 2023 Women's World Cup. Spain's Olga Carmona scored the only goal of the game in the first half. It's a double achievement, she says, winning today and also motivating more women to play soccer. Disappointed English fans shared that same optimism for the future. Their legacy will live on. Like, I'm, I'm looking up my local teams, I'm getting into it, and I'm feeling like all my friends are, we want to support women. Spain's victory comes in the face of recent turmoil for the team. Last year, 15 players stepped away, calling for a more professional environment and better pay. Three of them played in this tournament. This observer says their journey underlines the challenge for women in sports. As women, we tend to have, you know, have to do that little sort of extra push. We have to perform a little bit better. We have to prove ourselves a little bit more. And in the end of the day, a lot of the times we do do it, but we have so many barriers stacked up against us. And I think Spain proved that we can still do it. This soccer analyst says there needs to be more professional leagues. You know, the little girl that's starting at five, she doesn't really know. But when you start being 15 years old, you've got chances to be on the provincial teams and on the national squad. And you know that there's a professional league to look at. 
it brings a lot more chances for these really good players, really good women, young women to develop. The World Cup was a global hit for broadcasters, and FIFA announced it sold more seats than during the last tournament in 2019. And the audience numbers all across the globe really do tell a story of how massive the sport is. And I think federations right now need to invest into their teams, into their national teams. In fact, on Saturday, the Australian government pledged over $100 million to women's sports, including soccer. Chloe Rinaldi, CBC News, Montreal. Fire crews from across BC have come together in the Okanagan. People are going to be shocked when they go home and see their backyards uh, blackened, but their homes still standing. West Kelowna's fire chief on the efforts to save lives and land. And this is called Rock On. As the risk of wildfires grows, so have efforts to innovate. Both sides of this are resistant to fire. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Definitely it's a day where we can take a deep breath and make really strategic objectives, achievable objectives, and, and really make uh, some headway on, on what we're working on. Some optimism today from officials in Kelowna. Crews have made gains against the fires around Lake Okanagan, but many challenges are still ahead. Evacuation orders and alerts remain in place. Well, as we did on Friday, let's check in with the Chief of West Kelowna's Fire Service, Jason Broland. And, and Chief Broland, I saw some good news from you earlier today. You said things seem to be moving forward. Is that still your, your feeling tonight? Over the last 36 hours, we've certainly had a reprieve in the weather, uh, which has resulted in a reprieve in the fire conditions. Uh, it's cooler. We don't have the extreme wind that we were seeing, and therefore we're not seeing that extreme fire behavior. For the first time in this incident, my men and women are actually able to go out and, and use the traditional firefighting techniques that, that we're used to on this fire. Digging guard, tying in, hosing down hotspots, mopping up. And the difference is, though, it's on a massive scale. On a massive scale, on a, you know, like a continuous firefight over the last few days. Uh, describe for us what you've been seeing in, in terms of the, the challenge for, for your firefighters. Well, none of us put this shirt on. None of us start our career as firefighters setting out to lose. Um, you know, some of, uh, some of my people described it as like striking out in the ninth inning. And, you know, that's how personally we all take the losses that we experienced. And it's, it's going to be a, a, a difficult few days, not because of firefighting necessarily, but because of processing uh, the emotion and the realization that uh, people are going to come to, um, there are, there's no question, there's a significant number of houses that have been lost, but there's also so many that have been saved and people are gonna be shocked when they go home and see their backyards uh, blackened, but their homes still standing. And, and so let's talk about some of those or or one of those ninth inning wins. I think you described earlier some situations where firefighters managed to stop the fire, what, really close to some people's decks, you know, very near their homes. Yeah, there are business owners. Uh, there are residential property owners uh, who are going to go home to their neighborhood. They're going to see that their neighbors lost their house and they're gonna see that the fire came right down to their back patio. They're gonna see their patio furniture has been moved by firefighters pushed out into the yard in order to stop ignition uh, potential. And it's going to be a lot for people to take in. Well, I, you know, there'll be some cause for, you know, celebration, I guess, in some cases. Uh, but as you pointed out, definitely some tough days ahead for for your firefighters, but also for your community, West Kelowna. Chief, thank you very much for speaking with us again tonight. You're welcome. Let's connect with the mayor of Kelowna, Tom Dias. And, and mayor, first of all, how are you doing this evening? Um, we're doing better this evening. I mean, the conditions over the last 24 hours have helped um, our communities and our surrounding communities. 
Uh, last night we were down to about 10 degrees and the winds have been very calm throughout the day. So it's allowed um, the first responders, the firefighters to um, put a position where it ends up being they're able to look at um, uh, being on the offense as opposed to where they were being on the defense um, in the last, uh, you know, the 24 or 48 hours prior to that. Yeah, and a similar story as you know in West Kelowna, so the, that's nice to hear. Uh, now, you were out of town when the fire hit that area, so, so describe for us what it was like as you arrived back home. Um, there was a, a feeling of relief to, to be back home, uh, to be here. Um, a little bit of apprehension because of, you know, what I left behind, but there was definitely a feeling of relief. I, I had to fly into Vancouver um, because Kelowna um, Air, Airport at that point in time was closed. And then I drove uh, through the night. So when I arrived back in this area, it was early morning. The sun was just coming up, but it was a very um, bright uh, orange through the smoky cloud. It was a little bit of an eerie feeling. Uh, the roads were, um, there was very few people, very few individuals on the roads. The, the smoke uh, was uh, not very high in the sky, so it, it held a very low presence over the, over the city. It kind of had... Um, the feeling, a little bit of a feeling of a Stephen King novel and, uh, you know, the landscape from something like that. So it was a very eerie feeling, but it was also an appreciated feeling because then I knew that the message was received by the residents to, uh, to stay in, to stay off the roads so that the emergency service vehicles were able to do what they needed to do to help fight the fires. We know the city of West Kelowna has been hit hard. Some homes have been burned. We don't have the count yet. What about your city, Kelowna? There's also been structures that we have lost um, in the city of Kelowna. I believe, uh, you know, there's structures in Lake Country which have potentially been lost. But uh, um, obviously, the, the city of West Kelowna uh, was hit the hardest. And I know that as soon as they have are comfortable with regards to the, the fighting and the control that they have on the fires, um, that the next uh, order of business that they're going to look at doing is, is delivering the messages of the structural counts and what home has been affected because it's, um, it's, it's, it's created anxiety for those individuals within our community who are concerned about their residents, who are concerned whether they have a home to go back to. Well, I, I know I speak for a lot of people across the country when I say we're happy to hear that cooler weather, less windy conditions uh, have, have meant maybe things are looking a little bit better. Mayor, thank you very much for speaking with us. Ian, thank you very much for your time this evening. Some experts are pushing for government aid to protect homes from wildfires, and they say the stakes are high. We're going to lose communities. Um, and not just lose communities, we'll have a mass casualty event. What's being proposed and why some aren't waiting? In response to record wildfires across North America, some are investing in what's being called climate resilient homes. Researchers say the homes are better equipped to withstand extreme weather events like wildfires. Earlier this summer, Anita Bath visited areas experimenting with these new designs. Morning. So this flame is 1,500 degrees Celsius? Yes, that's right. An experiment in the future of construction, pitting one material against another. The result is almost instant. So see here how flames come up here? Nothing. The wood block on the right catches fire in a matter of seconds. The other one is virtually unscathed. So the question is, if you live somewhere with a wildfire risk, which do you want your house to be made of? The one you probably picked uses a 10,000-year-old technique. So it should be sticky, and it should not uh, fall apart by itself. It, so it's really simple. It smells like dirt, it looks like dirt, yes, feels it, like dirt. That's because it is dirt, mixed with a chemical stabilizer or cement to make it water resistant. Researchers at the University of California, Davis, are studying compressed earth block construction with the hope that you can extract the material for free from the site you're building on. The idea is that you can rent a machine like this yes. to build your house. Yes. So somebody does have to get their hands a little dirty. Yeah. About a minute later, the machine produces these. And then it's going to make block out of it. 
strong enough for a two-story building, says Dr. Nitin Kumar, and affordable because of the material involved. It is not even uh, the fire resistant, it is non-combustible. It's not fire resistant, it's fireproof, windproof, earthquake proof. Yes. That's a tall order for this yes. brick. Yes. But you're confident in it. Uh, yes, yes. The idea is still in its infancy, but it's part of a growing body of science around building homes that can withstand what climate change is throwing our way. To find out more, we've come deep into the mountains of Northern California, where crews are working to build what they call a fully wildfire resilient home. Its design may not be everyone's cup of tea, but for those already devastated by disaster, safety is first and foremost. Vern, you're building these Q cabins, these houses. You're not saying they're 100% fireproof, but sort of. Right, we don't really use that word. What we do is we build a structure that is 100% non-combustible. So, okay, so this is all. Vern right, Sneed uses all steel stuff. as the main construction material on his Quonset huts. Instead of hammering nails into wood, the house is welded together. Even the framing avoids conventional materials that can catch fire. So this is called rock on. In favor of this. And it is a layer of concrete board, a layer of insulation, and a layer of concrete board. And so both sides of this are resistant to, to fire. So if you were to take a blowtorch to this, to the steel, what would happen? You would find that it does not catch on fire. None of Sneed's Quonset huts have been tested in an actual wildfire, but steel only melts at very high temperatures and doesn't spread flames. When the house that originally sat here was flattened by a blaze in 2019, a similar Quonset garage on the property was the only structure on the entire hillside left standing. Enough evidence for the owners to call Sneed days later to start their rebuild. A Quonset hut being a curve, when, if the fire is approaching the curve, the building is fading away from the fire. So that's a real advantage when the fire is approaching a building, to have the building sloping away. We don't show an overhang. We have an overhang, but it's all steel. So there is no soffit venting, no way for any fire to get into an attic. The cost, he says, is pretty similar to a regular build while being mold and insect free too. I mean, it sounds like the perfect place to live. No so why aren't more people building like this? You know, this is Northern California, number one. We have a huge wood industry. Wood is relatively inexpensive here, so it's hard to compete. But at the same time, what is the cost of a house that, you know, that burns down? and the rebuilding of it. A question people in regions at risk of wildfire all over North America are grappling with. We're heading now to look at some more ways that people are building fire resilient homes. You know, Northern California is no stranger to wildfires. It has seen several in the last decade that have destroyed communities, including the town of Paradise. A lot of people in the area believe it's a matter of when, not if, another fire comes through and ravages another town, so they're vowing to be prepared. Heavenly Father, please help us. The campfire leveled the town in 2018, killing 85 people and destroying almost 19,000 buildings. Most of them were older and built before any sort of wildfire standards had been introduced in California. Today, just 10% of what burned has been rebuilt, but the town now has some of the strictest fire building codes in the U.S. The Paradise Campfire wrecked our world, burned my house down, took everything from us in a blink of an eye. Flames tore through Gary Ledbetter's home just 10 days after he and his wife had moved in. Refusing to ever be a victim again, he's taken drastic measures in the new construction on his old site, setting another example for communities at risk. Anything that's a weak point on this envelope of the building is an entry point for a ruthless fire. Ledbetter has gone above and beyond the paradise and state regulations for building in a wildfire zone, earning his property a first-of-its-kind designation from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. IBHS spent more than a decade testing materials and designs against a wall of embers, allowing researchers to create a standard for what they call a wildfire-prepared home. And I see a sprinkler up there. Yep, I have a sprinkler, I have a network of sprinklers on the rooftop. 
This home is built far beyond what's now considered safe, with the highest standard in fire-resistant roofing and those sprinklers mounted on top. Vents stopping embers from getting into the attic, a three-layer stucco siding, and double-pane windows. There's also a large amount of space between his house and anything that can catch fire. He's even got the smallest details covered. See that wrapping around that pipe? This is fireproof material, and this is what they use on the exhaust pipes of motorcycles. That's not a requirement. But it all comes Another back to how much this costs. Ledbetter road. knows not everyone can afford to do all of this. He says governments need to ante up to help. Policy. Go for policy. I guarantee you if the government could say, I'll give you this much money if you qualify to replace these windows, replace the siding, do something to make your house more resilient, that is cheaper than letting it burn and then losing a whole township. It's cheaper to proactively invest in people's homes. Most Western states do have some sort of grant to help people retrofit their houses, but Canada is far behind, despite wiped out communities in BC and Alberta and 150 homes lost this year in Nova Scotia. Protection is a growing concern as we experience our worst wildfire season in recent memory. While many Canadian cities have strengthened building codes for new homes, most people live in older ones, and without incentives to harden existing properties, there are big risks. For whatever reason, we just haven't adopted or developed a program. Maybe cost? Wildland fire ecologist Bob Gray says that's a problem because Canada's wildfires hit rural areas the hardest, where residents are typically older and on a fixed income. Right now it's sort of wishful thinking that we'll fully fire smart our communities without some type of financial program because the reality is it's expensive and a lot of people just can't afford to do it. He proposes a cost share program based on income or the government fully funding it. Worried if that doesn't happen, the toll will be catastrophic as climate change increases the number, size and frequency of wildfires. What's your fear if we don't do it? We're going to lose communities. Um, and not just lose communities, we'll have a mass casualty event. That's what myself and most of my fire colleagues worry about the most. Years like this, if we don't do this in a big way, people will, will die. Until things change, many will remain at risk on both sides of the border. For now, some just hope to be an example to help save homes and lives. Some experts Anita spoke with told her Canada is lagging behind the U.S. in helping people fireproof their homes. But in May, the federal government announced a $6 million grant to help homeowners in Lytton, British Columbia, rebuild with fire-resilient homes. Two years ago, that community was devastated by wildfire. Coming up, capturing images of B.C.'s wildfires as they grow ever closer. The experience behind the lens. We'd like to end the show tonight with some of the pictures of the B.C. wildfires and the CBC photojournalist who's been taking them. Ben Nelms is back in Vancouver. And Ben, how are you doing this evening? Yeah, not bad. Just uh, processing uh, a long 48 hours. Yeah, I mean, your photos have been compelling. And, and I'm really curious about the moments that stand out for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, yesterday, I was in um, Scotch Creek, uh, which is under evacuation order. Um, but, um, you know, in this, in this sort of instance, I thought that pushing the reporting uh, was, was meaningful and, um, you know, something that needed to be done. So I took a boat uh, with another fellow that lived in Scotch Creek and had a business and he was ferrying evacuees up and down the coast of the North Shushwap. And I just remember being on this boat um, with, you know, there was um, a dad with his two kids that had evacuated and he was going back to Celesta to fight fires for his community and um, just seeing the resilience of, of these people and, you know, the face of, of one of the worst wildfires in a long time. It's often a challenge on stories like this to, to try to get the access that, that, that we want and yet at the same time you're dealing with people's really difficult moments. How, how did you and, and, and they handle that? Any time you cover a natural disaster or a crisis, um, you have to think about, you know, how your presence affects the scene or, or how it doesn't. Um, I'm always reevaluating, you know, what I'm doing, who I'm talking to, exit strategies. Um, I have training to, you know, work in these hostile environments. But um, I'm just grateful that, 
you know, people uh, trust me enough, just meeting them within minutes to let me tag along with them in, in some of the lowest uh, points of their life, uh, most likely, and take pictures and document it because telling their story uh, to, you know, everyone around the world about how serious this this matter is um, goes a long way. Yeah, and we really appreciate the pictures you took and, and this chance to chat tonight, Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. I'm glad we had that chance to to talk to Ben because it just it's a reminder of the power of the still photograph in the hands of a photojournalist and also, you know, it's good to hear the care he takes with where he shoots and, and how he shoots. And just a reminder of the immense challenges facing so many in British Columbia and the Northwest Territories tonight. That's the National for August 20th. I hope you have a